So, we're in week three of our mentor series. Um, somebody tell me what a mentor is. Leader, like a teacher. Someone Leader, you look up to. teacher. Somebody what? Someone you look up to. Somebody that you look up to? Cool. All right, so those are all really good uh, definitions of what, what a mentor is. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the things that we've covered in the last couple of weeks. We'll highlight some of those. Um, don't feel like if you missed it, it's too bad. You can check them out on YouTube or you can get caught up this, this evening as we summarize a little bit before we get into week three. This has been our series theme verse. Um, you guys can follow along up here or in your notes, however you guys desire to. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. So this text is our foundation that we've been building on for this series because we feel like it's important for you guys to reflect on the things that people that you see as leaders in your lives have taught you, people that you look up to, um, the things that they've taught you help develop you as a student and soon into an adult. And those things shape your life, your faith, and the things that you, you know, go and achieve um, through our, our mentors, our leaders, helping us achieve those things. Uh, week one, we talked about uh, mentors do what? Does anybody remember what week one was about? Encourage. Mentors encourage. Cool. All right. So mentors encourage us. And we talked about a scripture in 2 Timothy. This was supposedly Paul's last letter. Um, that he wrote, and he wrote it to Timothy, uh, and he called Timothy his son, and he talked about how much fun he had spending time with Timothy, and Paul was like Timothy's mentor, is what we talked about, kind of like Mr. Miyagi and, and Daniel's son over there, and we talked about how mentors encourage us to reach beyond our physical self and to draw from that which is spiritual, and what we meant by that is that Paul encouraged Timothy, he said, you have a faith that's inside of you that's not full of fear you shouldn't be timid but you should have a, a, a love power and self-control that spirit lives within you and you can change people's lives if you believe it that same spirit that raised christ from the dead lives inside of you and paul encouraged timothy and he said look don't don't let that flame burn out that faith that you have but continue to fan it and share your faith. Don't be ashamed of it. Be bold and be transparent with who you believe, what you believe, and why you believe what those things are. So that was week one. Week two, does anybody remember week two? Challenge. Mentors challenge. Good. So mentors challenge you to walk faithfully with God in every area of your life. We talked about uh, from Paul's letter to Timothy again. He wrote and he challenged Timothy, don't get involved in gossip. Don't get involved in arguments. Be kind and patient to everyone. Even those difficult people, we talked about those people that are really hard to love and to, to be kind to, we need to, to love them. We need to show them Christ. And we talked about five ways that mentors challenged us, and uh, that's kind of some of the highlights that we talked about in week two. Now week three, we're going to talk about how mentors teach us, which is tonight. And week four, we're going to talk about mentors send us out into the world. Um, if you're following along in your Bibles, this is our text tonight. If you guys want to follow along in there, feel free to do so. Um, if you want to follow along on your notes, uh, the scripture's on the back side. It's small enough that we can put it on there. And we'll have it up on the screens up here um, for you guys to follow too. How many of you guys remember when you first learned how to tie your shoes? Anybody, anybody remember when they first learned how to tie their shoes? Who taught you how to tie your shoes? Anybody remember? My grandpa. Grandpa. Anybody else? Mom or dad? Miss Hergy. Church? Church taught you how to tie the school? No, Miss Hergy. Oh, Miss Hergy. Cool. All right, how many of you are loop, swoop, and pull people? Anybody? One? One loop and swooper? How many, guess, is, the guess, how many is the bunny ears? <laughs> All right, we've got a couple of each. You do both. If you're like ambidextrous, you do both shoe tie like this. Um, all right, I'm a, I'm a bunny ear person. That's how I learned how to do it. I, when I was younger, I couldn't really get the loop, swoop, and pull thing down very well. How about bike riding? Does anybody in here not know how to ride a bike? We need to teach you how to ride a bike, dude. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
Does anybody remember their first time losing the training wheels and really just going on that bicycle, just cruising? All right. Um, as I was writing this this message, I was thinking about when I was your guys' age and, and even younger. When I was when I was beginning to to ride with no training wheels, you know, it's that day that it's kind of scary, but it's kind of exciting. You're pulling the training wheels off, and you're ready to just go cruising, but you're kind of afraid that you're going to wipe out. Bless you. So we get on our bike. And my dad takes the training wheels off and to kind of make it a little smoother transition for me, put me in the grass so that if I fell that I wouldn't smash, you know, my arms up or whatever on the cement. But what he did, you know, because you can't really ride a, a bike in the grass without knowing how to ride the bike with two wheels or whatever, unless you got skills. So he kind of put me on a hill. All right. So I went down a hill in grass. Um, <laughs> And that's how I learned how to ride a bike. And my dad taught me how to do that. And for some reason, I felt like I crashed if I was reflecting about it and thinking about that first time. But he was telling me, he's like, dude, you didn't crash. And, he was, and I learned after about 10 minutes of driving with, I say driving, I drive my bike. You guys ride your bikes here in America. I drive them, okay, uh, in Canada. So I drive my bike. I'm driving this bike down the hill and, um, I guess, you know, within 10 minutes, I had the hang of it and I was able to maneuver the bike without any help. So these are all things that, you know, we learn as kids. Um, and there's other things in our lives, like we learn how to do our hair if we're a girl or how to do our makeup or we learn how to kick a football or we learn how to swing a baseball bat. We learn these things throughout our years and there's people who teach us them. Well, those are amazing things that they contribute to our lives. But we want also to teach you guys um, spiritually. We want to be able to leave you with applications and understanding of God's word so that when you leave here, you can reflect 10 years from now. Hey, I remember when I was sitting in youth and blah, blah, blah was, was said. And that's how I'm to live my life by based on this scripture and these applications. And so that's what our hope is that we can get from tonight is that mentors teach us. So if you guys want to follow along in your scripture, um, feel free to do so. Uh, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had to say. So a little background information. Jesus is out you know, with his disciples telling people about the kingdom of God and and doing all these things, traveling to these villages, healing these people. And right before this story, how many of you guys have heard the Good Samaritan? Whether we've heard the story or not, we've always we've heard of that term of the Good Samaritan, and it comes from the scriptures in this chapter in Luke about this guy who's uh, been beaten up, and the person who helps this beat up guy is a Samaritan who would probably be one of the least likely ones to help this person based on this list of a priest and a Levite, which are like holy people that you would think would be doing good things, but it's the Samaritan who reaches out to this person who's injured. And how many of us remember what the two greatest commands are that Jesus taught his disciples? Anybody remember to do what? To love? Love what? God. Love God. Okay, what was the second one? Love, okay, love your neighbor. All right, so in this book, before our story today, there's a reference of loving your neighbor. And uh, we're going to dive into some scripture today that really drives home the first commandment. And so Jesus is on the scene with these two ladies. Uh, we've probably read about the story about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You guys heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead. Um, Mary and Martha are, are Lazarus's sisters. And so Jesus goes into this village. Martha opens her home up to him. And they start hanging out. Now, it wasn't just Jesus. It was the disciples. It was everybody who was with Jesus in this caravan or in this group of individuals that were traveling. And so they enter into this house. They're staying with Martha and Mary. And what we find out right away is that Mary... Uh, doesn't want anything to do with chores or preparing or getting ready for meals or whatever, but what we find out is that Mary wants to spend time with, with Jesus. 
She wants to hear about Jesus' teachings. She wants to be in the presence of the Son of God. And so um, we learn a little bit more here about this story in verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So Martha's getting ready. She's probably got, you know, the pot roast in the oven. You know, she's getting the potatoes cut. She may be washing the disciples' underwear that have came in from out of town, okay? She's doing all of these chores for these neighbors, these people who've come into her house as guests to prepare for a meal and to prepare to send them on, preparing their bedrooms so that they have places to sleep and things like that. And Martha's upset. Martha, you can hear how upset she is in verse 40 when she says, Lord, don't you care about my sister, that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to come and help me. So Martha's upset. You know, Mary, we automatically think of Mary as like this, you know, butt kisser. You know, she's sitting next to Jesus, and she's like wanting to be Jesus' favorite. But Martha is doing all this work and really isn't getting any credit for it. And, uh, you know, she's kind of the one slaving away, making things so that Jesus and his disciples can eat and whatever else. And it's interesting to hear Jesus' response here in verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So Jesus says to her, look, Martha, you're wasting your time. The things that are going on right now with me talking to Mary, this is going to last forever. The things that I teach her, the things that I share with her are never going to leave her. The fact that you're cleaning the house and sweeping and making dinner and doing all this, it's going to be gone tomorrow. These distractions, these worldly things that have got your attention away from me are pulling at you. And so he's saying, look, you got it all wrong, girl. This girl over here, Mary, she's got, she knows what's best for her. And how does this apply to us today? How many of you look at this and kind of like overwhelmed looking at this picture? Because uh, I probably could have put more on here. But some of these pictures up here represent things maybe that are involved in your lives, like um, God. Um, the sock monkeys, that's supposed to be a family, okay? I thought that was kind of fun. Um, band, drama, social media. We've got like every single social media app on our phone. So if once we're done with Instagram, we close it and we get our Facebook up and then we look at Facebook and then we look at Twitter and then we look at Tumblr and then we're like looking and we're Skyping people now. And so we've got all those things occupying us there we've got school we've got church we've got video games and then down here these four colorful people those are represent our friends and then we've got the cell phone world that like has got us right here and we're just and we're creating random i mean the fact that we can create farting emoji texts means that we've probably spent too much time with emojis all right um, but it's hilarious okay don't get me wrong i love it um and then we've got sports and stuff so um, some of us may feel like this guy in the center of this, this world of things that are coming at him, that are bombarding him, that are pulling him away, that are taking his attention, that are distracting him. Because the sad thing about this is even if you only have about two or three of these things up here, um, the, the hard thing about it is, is that each one of these things probably have subcategories that, you know, if... You're in sports, you probably have to practice, and you probably have to do tournaments, and you probably have to work out and keep yourself in good shape. If you're um, hanging out with your friends, you don't just do that. Um, you kind of, your friends take a lot of your life and take a lot of your time away from you. Um, if you're in school, now listen, okay, I'm not saying you eliminate school from your equation to spend time with God, okay? That's not what I'm saying. We're gonna get to analyzing and figuring out what how this is supposed to line up but we spend hours upon hours doing some of these activities and our time with god may be this or maybe nothing at all um i and and don't think that this is just you guys it's me as well um i have a game on my phone that i'm addicted to um 
so much that one Friday that I had off, um, I woke up, my phone was 100% charged, and two hours later, my phone had 8% of uh, battery left, and it was because I'd been playing this video game for two hours straight and building up my characters in this stupid video game, okay? And so how much distraction was that game for me that I had to plug in my phone I had no more battery left on my stupid phone because I played video games forever. So think about this and think about how this kind of translates to us and where we're at because I feel like our scripture tonight um, gives us three things that mentors can teach us based on our story. Um, the first thing is that mentors teach you to remove distractions, okay? The author of Hebrews wrote, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witness to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. It's easy to get entangled, to get hold of things in this world that take away our attention, our time, everything that we are, so much that uh, we're distracted with so many different things we're getting pulled in so many different directions that next thing you know our time with god is kind of limited um, if it is at all and so mentors help us keep our our focus on the cross they help us remove the distractions jesus looked at her and he said mary or martha you've got it all wrong dude you're spending all this time preparing a meal and preparing you know, places to sleep for us. But what Mary's doing is what you need to be doing. He said, this isn't worth anything for tomorrow. Um, the second thing that mentors teach us is that mentors teach us not to worry. They teach us to, to give our worries to God. And in First Peter chapter 5, verse 7, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. How many of us spend an hour or two hours getting ready in the morning for school? How many of us spend 45 minutes? You know, how many, how many of us spend this extra time that we try to make ourselves look like something and we're so concerned about what other people think, we're worried about these things that we portray something that maybe we're not, but we're distracted as well by trying to, to please other people. And we've got so many concerns in this world that we focus our attention on and we don't give them over to God. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, that the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and that the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So if God's foolishness is smarter than the wisest that we can be, and if God's weakness is stronger than our, if his weakness is stronger than any of our strength, then everything that we have, we should trust God with. Now, it's not easy. We want to grab hold of things and have control and things like that, but God tells us to give our anxieties, our cares, our worries over to him because he cares about us and he wants us to give those things to him, to trust him with those things in our lives. All right. Anybody remember the Nokia over here? You guys are like, I don't even know what that phone is. I have you. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right. Um, and everybody obviously probably recognizes our nest, nice iPhone 5S over here. Um, what, what was the purpose of phones? When phones were invented, what was the purpose of phones when, when they were invented and created? To make phone calls, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> depends on which generation you grew up in, dude. Um, and that's what we've gotten to, that phones have evolved into things that can do other things. We can play games, we can edit pictures, we can look at our social media, we can listen to music, we can watch movies, we can make phone calls. But how much battery life do we have as we open these apps in our phone in a daily life, how many of us have to admit that we probably charge our phones more than once, at least once a day, a couple times a day, all right? 
Um, most of us probably have to charge our phones if you have a smart here or whatever smartphone you have. Our batteries drain faster and we're less actually making calls in which they were created for and we're more spending time with other apps that may tell us college football scores, that may tell us uh, what the temperature is, that may tell us um, we may be candy crushing all day long, crushing some candies. All right, we may be doing a number of things that kill our battery and kill what it actually was created for that distract the phone, that drain it so that it can't actually be used for its purpose. So how does this apply to us? How does this phone thought apply to, to us and our relationships with God? Because we're very much like that phone that was created in the beginning to make calls because nowadays our phones are less and less used for calls. They're used for numerous of things that take away from the actual purpose of the phone, the purpose of calling someone. And I think that this kind of translates to us and our relationship with God, that mentors teach us to make God number one. In this story, Mary's got it right. She's sitting at Jesus' feet. She's listening to what Jesus has to say. And you know what? We were talking earlier, and that's probably the harder thing to do. It's easy to stay busy in our lives. It's easy to stay involved in sports, in drama, in music, in band, in you name the list. You guys are involved in it. I know you are because that's what you do when you're teenagers. You get involved in stuff and you stay active. The hard thing about it is, is where's God fall in this category? Are we in the center of all of this mess of things in our lives that we have to figure out where are we going to give our time to? Because Jesus said that the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. That doesn't mean that you can't do other things. That's not what this teaching is about tonight. This teaching is about evaluating our priorities. Evaluating what's most important, what should be most important, and what should be least important, or maybe should be below whatever's most important. And I believe that this is what our lives should look like. That God should be above everything else that is in our lives. Our friends, our family, our sports, our drama, our music, our games, our stupid cell phones that take take all our battery life so our phone's dead at 8% because I played video games for two hours straight. Even church. You can over-church yourself and not spend time with God. And you guys are like, how does that make sense? Well, let me give you an example from myself. It's easy for me to spend time writing sermons, programming, preparing for events, setting up decorations. It's easy for me to consume my life with the ministry activities and not the time with God so that God falls down the ladder and, well, I'll spend time with God as soon as I get done setting things up. And I'll spend time with God as soon as I get done teaching this message. Or I'll spend time with God as soon as this event's over or this program's finished. It's not just you guys. It's me, too. I'm guilty of this, and I need more of God so that everything else can be in balance, in line, in our faith. And as we place God in that spot that he needs to be, he'll give us the time that we need to work out the rest of the things, our relationships, our sports, our games, our whatever we're doing. But it, if he's not there, then those things that we learn how do we transfer those things that we learn about God and who he is and how he loves people? How do we transfer those to the, our activities or to people that we know if we're not even willing to spend time with them? If we're not willing to make him the most important thing in our lives? So this is our conclusion for tonight. Mentors teach you to put life's distractions aside and put your relationship with God on high. I know, like, kind of like a, you know, it's easy for us 
to get distracted. Even in good things. Family's good. I'm not saying family's bad. But I can even acknowledge that my time that I spent reading my Bible over the past week when I had family in town visiting from all over the country because of my brother's wedding, that I, my time with God went down because I had so much time with family. Should that happen? Probably not. My, God, my time with God should increase. My time with God should be that much more so that I can share these things that I'm learning about my relationship with God. So think about tonight and think about the distractions that you face personally because each one of us have our own things that distract us from our relationship with Christ. It could be sin. It could be an activity. It could be music. Some of us have our headphones in so much that we can't even listen to what God's trying to speak to us because we are too busy jamming out to our beats. All right? If you ain't got beats, then you got generic beats. All right? And if you ain't got generic beats, then you got the Apple earplugs. All right? So, you know, like, think about those things that distract you from your relationship with God and evaluate how can God be above those things? How can God be in charge of it all and you devote the rest of your time to those other things in your lives? So we're going to pray and then we're going to break off into small groups. Um, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Forgive us for the times that we place things above you. Uh, Lord, help us to evaluate our priorities. Help us to evaluate uh, the things that we're involved in. And help us to put you first, regardless of what our lives look like. We know that we're busy, Lord, but we pray that we would make time for you. And you first, and, and let the rest fall into place, God. Lord, help us to learn from people that are living their lives faithfully to you to teach us to make you first, God. Lord, may you just take the rest of this evening, be with our small groups as they discuss, and be glorified uh, through our students' lives as they leave this place. We love you in your name.